Some call it an upset, others a miracle. Either way you slice it, this company's come back from the dead in a big way. That's this week on Motoring 2002. is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! You know, it wasn't that long ago when it looked like the Nissan Motor Company was toast. Billions of dollars in debt and a bland product. But then along came Renault and Carlos Ghosn, who took control of the cash drain, but who also knew that in order to survive, this company needed new and improved product. The result? Well, the improved Q45 and i35. And let's not forget the hugely successful Nissan Altima with a completely new facelift. In fact, this vehicle was Motoring's car of the year. But what about new product? Well, soon to come, of course, the 350Z, and this week, we're going to check out the all-new G35 as Nissan's luxury division takes dead aim at the European sports sedan market. Take a look at the 2003 Infiniti G35. The G35 is a completely new vehicle for Infiniti. It's a new platform, um, a, a really new way of thinking about the cars. We wanted to express our, the performance side of Infiniti, the, the uh, fun side of Infiniti, and, and this is what the G35 was about. We also wanted to make certain people could afford it. It's, a, it's an affordable luxury car, but with really high performance, uh, brand new platform, uh, brand new suspension, uh, a way of thinking about a car that's a little different than what we've used in the past. Uh, it came out of a lot of our racing experience. So it's a car that really expresses what the Infiniti brand is all about. Let's put it this way, in the past three years with the uh, Renault getting in the game, they now have money to expand. Uh, what they're doing right now, I think, is positioning themselves to be at par with the uh, Europeans. If you look at the G35, it's obviously going the 3 Series, C-Class at Mercedes, Audi A4, and the Q45 is already positioned to aim at 7 Series, S-Class, Audi A8. So basically, they're putting the program in place to be at par with what Europe does. Are you taking dead aim here at the Europeans with this G35? Well, that's an interesting question. Not really, um, because we, we just believe this is our expression of high performance uh, sedan. And uh, everybody has their own philosophy, and uh, the Europeans have their way of doing vehicles. This is ours, and we're very proud of the way this vehicle has been developed, so this is the way we think that a high performance sedan should be. The V6 engine is mounted slightly back of the front wheels. You get a very good balance of weight, 52.48 in this case. And the reason for that is very specific. As the vehicle accelerates, you want to maintain uh, weight on the front tires to give you good steering feel. So it's not 50-50, it's 52.48. 260 horsepower, comes right now with a five-speed automatic transmission, um, multi-link suspension front and rear, a lot of aluminum used in the multi-link suspension to make it very lightweight, uh, very large wheels and tires, uh, very good brakes. Uh, vehicle dynamic control. I mean, it's really a car that's designed to be driven and have a lot of fun. The success of the Altima, has that really helped them as they try this right now? Of course it did. I mean, they were, they were, they had nothing to lose. I mean, Altima was nowhere near uh, popular. And the new, the new one is really exciting and it probably will put Nissan back on the map for many products to come. As you know, the Altima is a front-wheel drive car and the G35 is a rear-wheel drive car. And uh, that's the direction of uh, Infiniti. The Infiniti lineup is to be rear-wheel driven uh, primarily. So having the G35 as a major player in, the, in that kind of segment of the, of the uh, market 
uh, helps establish uh, the vehicle and the, and the lineup. It's a market that will grow. I mean, clearly you can look at the trends, uh, the luxury portions of all market, all segments is really evolving and growing. So we see more customers buying these kind of cars, and we just think we have to stake out our portion of it the way that Infinity expresses itself. And G35 is really all about that. You can tell where this car was built just by looking at that grill. Now, can you tell me where this car was built? More later on Kenzie's Corner. You know, while many view the hatchback phenomenon as being something new in this country, it's been hot in Europe for years. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at Ford's interpretation of what a hot hatch should be. This is the all-new ZX-5. The beauty of the five-door hatchback design is that it allows the cargo capacity of a small wagon, but without the breadbox look. Indeed, it is the practical versatility without penalty that is the core of the design. While the three-door ZX-3 boasts a funky and expressive look, access to the back seat is awkward by almost any standard. The ZX-5's extra doors eliminates that, allowing easy access to all positions. You know, obviously the extra two doors of the ZX-5 help with the versatility, but then again, so does the layout at the back end. This thing goes up out of the way, so anybody under six feet won't have a problem. You can also fold either or both halves of the split folding rear seats flat. When flat, you've got 1,205 litres of cargo space. Perhaps a minor drawback, the seats actually stand about two inches proud of the rest of the floor. The one problem with the whole design, however, they forgot to put a handle on the back here. If you view this as a door, it really does deserve a handle. Now, if you've forgotten something in the back, you've either got to have the remote or run to the front and push the button. I think I've said enough on that subject. Beneath the hood, the standard 2.0-litre ZTEC engine brings a refined work ethic. Rated 134 horsepower at 5,300 RPM and 135 pound-speed of torque at 4,500 RPM, 80% of which clocks in at 1,200, this engine is quiet when cruising, yet brings a sporty tone when pushed. It also gives the ZX-5 a responsive, if somewhat less than fast, feel when mated to the 5-speed manual transmission. This gearbox is a well-engineered unit, with the low first and tall top gears bringing a responsive launch and comfortable cruising. Better yet, the shifter has a connected feel, while the clutch is light and nicely progressive. Now that's the good side of the transmission. The downside is a yellow upshift light on the dash. Now presumably anybody that buys a manual transmission knows how to shift it. So why you need a yellow light to tell you when to shift is beyond me. Fortunately, as Red Green would say, duct tape to the rescue. You just stick it on the dash right over the arrow. End of problem. A wide track, long wheelbase and compliant suspension adds up to an agile car with an excellent ride quality. Up front are the usual McPherson struts with an anti-roll bar. In back, Focus employs a fully independent multi-link design. Factor in the light and linear power assisted rack and pinion steering and the ZX-5 has a feel that matches its hot hatch persona. Indeed, it romped through the pylons. Now, this is particularly true when advanced track is added. This stability control system compares driver input with vehicle attitude. Should the two differ, it counters mild understeer by braking the appropriate wheel while reducing engine output. You know, the base ZX-5 comes very well appointed. You get air conditioning, power locks, windows, mirrors, cruise control, a rear wash wiper, which you really do need on this vehicle, as well as the tilt and telescopic steering. Now this thing's been optioned up to the point where the sticker reads almost $27,000. Now for that, you get a power moonroof, leather seating, side airbags, which are a good idea, advanced track stability control, and this up-level six-disc CD changer. It also comes with this pen-sized faceplate. Now when you pop this out, it renders the radio useless to anybody that shouldn't have it. Safety-wise, the ZX-5 enjoys a good anti-lock brake system that brings short controlled stops. 
Ford's personal safety system adds dual-stage front airbags, seatbelt pretensioners and force limiters. The available side airbags are a worthwhile option and certainly a rarity at this end of the market. You know, summing up this ZX-5 is really rather easy. It's fun, funky, versatile, comfortable and indeed quite capable. Now whilst this particular vehicle gives you sticker shock, the base model priced at a little over $20,000 is very competitive and as such well worth a look. Our Midas tip of the week concerns annoying noises coming from underneath your car. Modern cars have a number of heat shields either on or adjacent to the exhaust system to prevent overheating the floor of the car or another component that's close by, or in some cases shielding the catalytic converter so that if you park in a grassy area, you won't ignite the grass and cause a grass fire. The ones on the brakes prevent road splash from damaging the brake system, and it's very important that these shields are intact and in place and properly attached. Now they have to be thin so they don't add a lot of weight to the car, but being thin creates a problem. They break easily, they rust through, and in some cases spot welds break and they partially detach, interfering with another part and produce an awful noise. For example, on this car, the left rear brake shield is touching the wheel and producing an awful noise when the wheel rotates at low speed. Now, if we heat that up by welding it, we may repair the detachment, but we'll change the shape and it'll interfere with the wheel. So the best way to repair it was with a product called Cold Weld. On the exhaust system, we can use our imagination there and sometimes use MIG welding or stainless steel hose clamps to bring these heat shields back into contact with the exhaust system and prevent them from rattling. When they rattle, they produce that awful noise that drives you crazy. Use your imagination, either fix them or repair them, or if they're rusted through, replace them. That's your Midas tip of the week. So what if we were inventing the automobile today rather than over a century ago? It's my pleasure to present Autonomy. We've designed a vehicle that's revolutionary, both in its departure from the past and in its promise for the future. I think instead of a technology that's rooted in the 1800s with internal combustion engines, we're looking at something that's much more akin to the Jetsons. As you can see, we gave this chassis its own bright look. It has electric motors at all four corners. Also, we have the fuel cell stack and the hydrogen storage system embedded within the chassis along with the heat exchangers and controls. There's no internal combustion engine, no transmission, no drivetrain, no axles, no exhaust system, no mechanical steering, braking, and accelerating linkages. In fact, the only things moving other than electrons, protons, water, and air are the wheels and the suspension components. What we wanted to do was design that platform because it's going to get a lot of visibility because that's the heart of the vehicle. You know, we talk about powertrain being the heart of a vehicle. Well, that's literally the heart of the vehicle because an infinite number of bodies can go on top of this platform. As we uh, evolve through this, we're going to show a lot of different bodies on this. We chose to show a two-seater high-performance sports car type body on this just to show how exciting fuel cells can be. This is more than a technology and design exercise. In fact, we're going to have a drivable version of autonomy 
by the end of 2002. Just want to show you a couple of highlights of the interior of this G35 that I think are kind of cool. First, when you tilt the steering wheel, the instrument panel tilts with it. And as my friend Jim Kenzie likes to remind me, it was the Porsche 928 that first introduced this technology and also was used in the Ford Probe. Another thing I like is your seat controls. Usually on the side of the passenger's and driver's seat, you can't you can't see them. You're fumbling around for them. Well, Infinity has put them on top of the seat where they belong. Now, when it comes to seat memory, you're back to the side of the seat, fumbling around. Now, you may think that's not important, but believe me, guys like Bill Gardner, they wouldn't even look at a vehicle unless it had seat memory. Well, Bruce, forget the memory seats. I mean, Brad, I have to take this Ginkgo Biloba stuff just to remember where I parked that car. And power seats? I've got so many tools crammed around the seat in my pickup truck, it's permanently adjusted to me. It'll never move again. I can't loan it to anybody. It's a good reason not to loan it out. Anyhow, I want to talk this week about alignments. Now, many of our modern cars with independent rear suspension require what we refer to as a four-wheel alignment, where you can potentially adjust or correct alignment on all four corners of the car. Now, why do you want a dual-wheel alignment? Well, the, some of the reasons are so that the car will go nice and straight down the road, won't pull left or right, and won't wear the tires excessively. Also, so that the car will feel good in a crosswind situation or in a lane change, and you won't get erratic or uneven tire wear. These are all reasons why you do regular wheel alignments. These two tires I've got in the back of my pickup came off a vehicle just yesterday. It had worn parts and misalignment, and you can see that on this side of the tire, it caused the tire to completely wear smooth. It's bald on this side, and over here we've got 5 30 seconds tread depth. Now, I'm sure you've all driven a vehicle where you were fighting the steering wheel one way or the other, and the vehicle consistently wanted to pull left or pull right. You probably had a situation where you had a tire with uneven wear and or misalignment and worn parts. Now, we replaced the parts on this vehicle, replaced the tires, and when we did the four-wheel alignment, we did a before and after printout. And this is something that I strongly suggest you ask your alignment guy to do. Get a before printout, then you know how far it was out, where it was out, and you can see what you actually paid for, where they had to make the adjustments. The after printout will show you the difference between the two. And make sure that you keep these printouts on file in the vehicle. Keep them in the glove box or somewhere where you can easily refer to them in the future. And I'll tell you why. For example, you just put a new set of tires on after you did replace the worn parts and did your four-wheel alignment, you can still have a pull in the vehicle shortly after replacing those tires if you've got a bad tire, what we refer to as a puller tire. And it could have perfectly even wear, perfectly even inflation pressure, and perfect wheel alignment, and still have a pull. The way you confirm this is to cross-rotate the front tires and see if the pull goes from hard right to hard left when you cross the tires. That's what'll happen if you've got a bad tire. It'll go the other way. Then you put the tires on the rear, and the bad tire being on the rear won't cause the vehicle to pull because the rear wheels don't steer. Now you've confirmed a tire problem. But in this day and age, you're quite often dealing with multiple service shops. So if you didn't have a printout, when you go back to the tire place to try and get a warranty adjustment on the tires, they're going to want to do another four-wheel alignment and move the tires around again. And you've paid twice for this kind of work. So make sure you get these printouts, write the date and mileage, and any other notes of what was done at the time on the sheet, and keep it in the car. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2001. Man, I better take some of that ginkgo biloba. I just remembered it's 2002. Okay, word association time. Japanese car. Well, you probably think assembly quality, durability, maybe good fuel economy, but I bet you you don't think about styling. I mean, most Japanese brands don't have individual characteristics. In fact, the whole industry doesn't have anything that you can properly say is purely Japanese. British cars, well, you either have that perpendicular styling represented by something like a Morgan, or the Jaguar voluptuous curves with the chrome leather wood interior. That could only be British. 
German cars tend to be stark, very functional, black inside, crisp edges. Italian cars, well, they're exuberant, full of life, and mostly red. Japanese cars, well, they're mostly bland. Now, there have been some beautiful Japanese cars, but I can only think of one in history that's really been purely Japanese, the original Infiniti Q45. There was a lot of styling cues on that car that could only reflect the Japanese culture. And what did the market say? No thanks. So they stuck a fake Jaguar grill on it. That didn't work that well. Then they tried a, another version of the car that looked like a Bentley, and that didn't work that well either. Now they got a third generation trying to take another shot at that luxury market. And they also have a new car called the G35. Now they're calling this a European style sports sedan. Well, they've certainly got the performance. They've certainly got the ride and the handling. The styling, is that European style? Well, it's hard to say. I think the only niche where the Japanese market has a pure identity is with really young buyers in the 20s. They think of something like a Subaru WRX or a Mitsubishi Evo 7. They perceive those as being purely Japanese cars. But in the luxury and mass markets, well, I don't think the Japanese industry is really going to be there until BMW decides to build a Japanese-style sports sedan. I'm Jim Kent. Infiniti hopes to sell about 2,000 G35s this year, which will bring Infiniti's total sales in Canada to about 6,000 in a market that holds 1.5 million vehicles. Makes you wonder why they even bother. But you know, in the near future, Infiniti will be introducing a whole new range of product, and pretty soon, they'll have a car for every member of the family in their showroom. And believe me, if they weren't making money, they wouldn't be there. First impressions on the G35, I think they've definitely got a contender that's entering a crowded market, but also a market that continues to grow. Graham, of course, will have a closer look on a future test drive. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. A lot of women do feel intimidated coming into a garage, and I want them to know when they come into my shop what they're paying for when they leave so that they feel comfortable with the purchase that they've made. The car is an exceptional automobile. 571 horsepower, it's 0 to 60 in less than 3.6 seconds and more than 205 miles an hour top speed. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas.